Um, so the next talk is by me. Uh, it's on MongoDB. Uh, just to for, um, stick your hands up if you've used MongoDB before. Oh, quite a few people, more than uh, the weekend. So I did this talk at DD North at the weekend, and I was going to actually do it here first as like a prep. Uh, but it's, gonna, it's the other way around. So uh, this should actually be better than the weekend, um, maybe. Um, so everybody probably knows me. I run this user group. I also run a user group up in uh, York as well called .NET York. Uh, I mostly write JavaScript these days, but I do a bit of C Sharp. It's just flipped on its head quite a lot. And I also work for a company called Buybox, and I work completely remote now. I also sort of, um, contribute to quite a lot of open source projects as well. Uh, and I have some social feeds on there if anybody wants to tweet me and things. Uh, so the agenda for today is hopefully to get through um, quite a bit. Um, so we're going to go over a bit of a brief history of MongoDB and how it came about. Uh, the current database trends in the kind of uh, the area, including different types of databases, uh, who uses MongoDB, uh, and how the, doc the document structure is quite flexible and allows you to do lots of different things. And also how to model documents and the relationships between different documents. And also going to go through the basic like CRUD operations of how you're supposed to interact with your data in Mongo. And then a few things about how it makes it production ready. We're going to give a bit of a few bits of uh, CRUD uh, demos, and then uh, also some misconceptions around MongoDB. Uh, so a bit of history of Mongo. Uh, does anybody know Dwight Merriman? So he used to own uh, DoubleClick, and it got sold eventually to Google. Uh, and Dwight uh, was uh, behind uh, most of MongoDB, as well as Elliot. And Elliot was, uh, got on board of uh, DoubleClick at the same time as when uh, Dwight uh, founded it with another guy called uh, Kevin O'Connor. And after it got salt, they kind of went on their own ways to build up some uh, startup adventures. But they both kept end up with the same kind of scalability problems. And there was no kind of um, cloud platform to kind of just host all your stuff on at their time. So they both were trying to build the same kind of cloud hosting platforms to kind of deal with their problems. So they decided to both get together and found a company called TenGen uh, and build this cloud application platform like Google Cloud or uh, Azure or AWS. Uh, and the platform is called Ed because uh, most software developers are great at naming things. Obviously, Elliot and Dwight. Um, and then eventually got renamed to uh, Babel and MongoDB. So they noticed like, quite a lot of people that was really interested in their database technology. So they tried to pull the database technology away from their kind of cloud platform uh, and try to sell this as like a, sec uh, like a product in itself. And this wasn't very successful at all. So they thought, sod it, uh, let's just open source it. And at that time, in 2009, uh, the users started rapidly re uh, increasing uh, at that point. Uh, so these are just like database trends uh, currently, uh, up to this month, actually. Just took the screenshots at the weekend. Uh, so at the top, we obviously have Oracle, MySQL, and Microsoft SQL Server, uh, as you'd expect. And then right underneath them, we've got Progress SQL and actually MongoDB. So MongoDB is not that far behind, really. Um, compared to the database technologies that have been there uh, quite a while. And if you just look at the da uh, document databases out there um, against the MongoDB, MongoDB has been like trending upwards uh, since the dawn of time, really. Um, and it's well above every other document database technology. Uh, one thing to note is most of them are actually trending upwards, most because they're kind of buzz of like NoSQL and stuff. Uh, but one of them is actually kind of trending downwards. So, this is RavenDB at the bottom, and it's uh, kind of got a gradual income between uh, 2015, I think it is, and then it just kind of went down, down, down. And I've seen like quite a lot of companies just moving away from RavenDB for lots of different issues. Uh, but it's just a, uh, one kind of trend I kind of noticed um, within uh, kind of the database trends. And this is all online on the dbengine.com, uh, dbengine so you can check it out yourself. Um, so kind of who uses MongoDB? So you probably, if you want to take it on board, you probably want to know that it's stable and other people and big names are actually backing it as well. So we've got things like Google on there, eBay. Uh, what else we got there? We've got the government, uh, KPMG. So there's lots of well-known brands actually taking uh, uh, Mongo for the drive, really. Uh, but what is MongoDB? So it's a, as I said, it's a um, NoSQL database. But we all know NoSQL covers a lot, uh, vast like, um, uh, number of database technologies. Uh, so it's really a non-relational database. 
Uh, so it doesn't actually have uh, relationships between the entities inside it. But also that is also another bad name convention um, because there's lots of time series databases which fall into the same thing. Uh, there's um, key value pairs and also document databases. Uh, MongoDB is a document database, so really Mongo is a document database, which kind of segregates it from a lot of other database technologies out there. Uh, and these documents are stored in BSON, uh, and they're like a JSON kind of structure, but uh, binary uh, serialized, and they also uh, hold more types than JSON as well. And then using implicitly normalized, so I don't know if everybody can see that, but we've got a person object, and inside it they've got addresses. So these addresses are living inside the person object, and they're implicitly related to that. And uh, the idea is MongoDB is actually built for the cloud, so it's horizontally scalable. So you just keep adding nodes and not scaling up your uh, database. And the, uh, the last point is that it's actually simple to use. So actually getting something up and running and ready and deployed is a lot easier than other database engines out there. So we've got to know it's a document database, and it's uh, all based on BSON. Uh, but why do we uh, have BSON documents? So one of the reasons is, I said, you could store lots of different things on, uh, inside it. So these are a couple of things what you can actually store. We've got like double strings, objects, arrays, uh, binary blobs, object IDs. So there's lots of different things we can store. And this is, gives us the ability, because we've got these types, we've got abilities to um, query in a, a diff, uh, lots of different ways. So we can start doing, doing range queries, uh, intersections between things, uh, looking inside objects or inside arrays, checking the size of arrays, uh, lots of different things like that. Uh, also, uh, BSON documents are schemaless. Uh, but obviously, they still have schema behind them. So this is another kind of bad name, what people give it. Uh, so they're more like dynamically scheme. Uh, they have dynamic schema. And this means they still have a schema, but there's no upfront like defining your schema. So you can change it any given one time uh, without actually creating any kind of uh, schema update scripts. And th th that also means you can rapidly change your data structures. And that means that there's um, less admin time to actually release and deploy your application. Uh, but obviously, with it being a dynamic schema, um, you might want to be able to validate on certain aspects of your document as well. So uh, inside a document, you might want to validate that uh, somebody's got a name set uh, and their address set, but they might have some extra properties what you don't really care about. We can use a JSON um, schema to do this. And we can actually tell, uh, we can configure our database to kind of either give us warnings back from it and say, uh, sorry, this uh, document's got a, um, uh, it has not got its name on it. Uh, you might want to put a name on it. And we can actually throw an error back to it. So we can actually just blow up at the point of it inserting. So as soon as you try to insert it, it won't insert it into the database. It'll just say, no, I can't do that. Uh, so pretty much the same if you try to uh, throw something into like, um, uh, into SQL Server, but in a column that doesn't exist, for example. Uh, but obviously, this can be bypassed. So if you've got the admin privileges to bypass actually the, the validation, you can uh, do that. And this is usually do, done for like database restores or kind of when you're trying to remodel your data. Uh, so this is a bit of an example of two documents. So they're kind of similar in their structure. They might be stored in the same collection. So this is kind of an example of a user. We've got a user one and user two. They both got an ID. And they both got a name, so you can validate they both have names. And they both have an age as well, so you can validate that too. But they both have different in, um, fields for their kind of how they're authenticated. So this one has got a GitHub ID, and the other one actually has a Facebook ID. And that's completely fine. And you can put them both in the same collection, and they'll work um, identically when you pull them out. And how you interact with them two fields is completely up to your application's concern. But at the same time, we can still validate that they've both got a name and an age, and then tell the database to not insert anything which doesn't have a name and an age. So one of the bigger things with uh, using a, um, a document database is document modeling. A lot of people try to model their data structures as more relational form in a document database, which is what you don't want to do. Instead, you want to kind of model things for your application usage. So you have to think about how your application is using the data and just model it kind of based on that. And we'll go into that uh, an example later, which will probably make more sense. Um, so uh, the documents are built around atomic transactions. So any kind of action on a, a document, uh, either we updating its name or incrementing a value, they're all done atomically. So they'll be just uh, one after the other, like in a queue. 
uh, and we can take advantage of that for like concurrence issues or kind of adding things to array or checking values before we insert things. Uh, we also should embrace uh, embedding data. So if something is related to something else, we should just like put the data inside the other item, such as the address earlier. Also, we want to kind of not uh, deal with small documents because they're not very performant. So for example, if we had a bunch of uh, log entries, um, we could like bundle, roll them up into uh, day logs. So we're just inserting into an array inside a, a bigger document, so then we can query it later a lot more efficiently. But it's all dependent on your application usage, how you kind of roll your things up. Uh, also, UTC dates, so it should be always stored in, uh, uh, time should be always stored in UTC, sorry. Uh, and uh, arrays can be a nix as well. So this is like a big part of modeling. Uh, so for example, if you had a list of tags on a post, you can just index on that array, and it'll automatically unwind uh, that array and give it a, like, set an index for every single item in that array pointing back in the same document. So this is a, a little example of a, kind of a, a blog article on a website. Um, this is like in a relational kind of example, and then we'll go into like how we'd model that in a, uh, in a document world. So normally we'd have an article table, and then against the article table, we'd have an uh, author, because uh, that's the person who wrote that article, and we just have a join on that. So many authors could actually write, uh, many articles could actually be written by one author. So we've got a one to many relationship there. We also have uh, comments uh, relating to articles. So we have, we have many comments related to one article. And the same thing for a tag of an article. So if we're tagging that a C sharp article, we'd also store the tag so it could be reused in a tag a table. And then we'd have a join table in the middle, so then we can just keep reusing the same tag and query across that against multiple articles. Um, so if you think about that in a kind of more document world, we probably want to see how we're actually using this application to start off with. So this is our actual page of actually our uh, blog post. And at the top, we've got our title, and we've got our article text. We've got our comments at the bottom, which is our name and text as well. We have our author at the right hand side, and we have some tags at the bottom right as well. So if we're modeling that uh, kind of document, to start off with, we'd probably just get the article, which was the kind of the article table in the uh, relational world. And we just put it inside a document. So here we have a ID title and summary and some text. But we'd also want to put on the author directly onto this object as well, because we're actually using it like that as well. Uh, so we have a name and as bio, as Joe likes to code. And then the same thing for comments. So we're getting comments on top of this article. Uh, we just want to keep pushing into an array of comments every time, time somebody comments on to it. And the same thing for tags as well. So we can have an array of strings on this uh, document, and that is completely fine as well. Uh, there's also a hybrid approach where we can take, uh, do this as well. So maybe we might have an author's page as well. So we've got our blog page, which has uh, details about our blog and what it's all about. And then our authors might have uh, more information about them somewhere else. So they might navigate to a different page, like an author's page. Uh, this, uh, um, in this instance, we'll actually put it into a different collection. And this one will be uh, in authors. And then we just have some, have some more information on there. And uh, notice we can actually uh, create things with like article counts, actually say how many articles that guy's wrote as well. Uh, so we're just going to go through a bit of a kind of crudery usage to kind of um, how we um, interact with Mongo. Um, so this is not in actually C Sharp. Uh, this is actually in JavaScript, because the native language for the console, but JavaScript, uh, Mongo uses is JavaScript. Uh, but the actual kind of how you interact with the database is pretty much the same as if you're using Java, uh, C Sharp, JavaScript, pretty much all of them. Some of the languages have a bit more uh, like kind of help in hand because they're like typed. Um, so like C Sharp has a lot of um, builders to allow you to build up expressions a lot easier. Uh, so to create a document, all we need to do is call uh, DB and then enter a collection name. And then we call insert one. We pass in a document, what we want to insert. And this is just any old uh, Beeson document. And then we also can pass in a options to it, which actually has the only right concern on it. And this is how uh, the database is going to acknowledge um, what it does with that document. So the default, uh, if you just roll out MongoDB, it'll just write to one node. So write to disk of the, uh, the single node what you actually insert into. 
but you can also write, it, write to the majority of the cluster. So if you've got a, node, a, a replica set of three, you'll write to two of them. You can also write to the whole cluster. You can also make it so it only acknowledges <coughs> kind of your, um, your insert. So you might not even write it to disk, so you can just throw it to it and it says, yeah, I've received it. I've not done anything with it yet. Uh, but it's all, uh, this is all up to your, like, how you want to configure your application. So maybe uh, having thing con things consistent and written to two nodes, so you've got uh, something uh, like a disaster recovery um, uh, way to go about if a, a node fails. It'll fall over to a secondary, which is already has a data written on it because you've written to two nodes. Uh, it's all up to kind of how your application wants to use the database, really. So you make decisions. So is that uh, So that's... So it depends. So if you pass in uh, W2, it'll go send it to the master. The master will say, um, write to two nodes. So it'll write to the first one, make sure it writes to the second one, then acknowledge it and say, I've, I've done my work. Um, but if it's written to one node, it'll only write to one node, and then it'll replicate, uh, replicate uh, in the given future. So for an example of kind of how we insert the document, we can pretty much just uh, call db.events. Uh, and insert one, and we can pass it a name and a, a date, uh, and that'll just uh, respond back saying, I've acknowledged this is written to the first node, uh, and give us the object ID back from it. Uh, it's the same thing for if you're creating uh, many uh, documents, we can just uh, push in an array. So we call the db.collection name, and then insert many, pass an array. Uh, this time we get the right concern, which is exactly the same property as before, and we also get a property called ordered. Uh, and by default, this is set to true. So this will, every single document, it'll try to insert in order. And if it gets to the one where you can't insert because there's validation rules or something went wrong, uh, it'll just stop at that point and won't do the rest of the documents. So if you've got, up to, if you've got 10 to insert and you've got up to the seventh one, it errors, they, the rest of them are not inserted, only the six are inserted. Uh, if you set that to false, it'll, it doesn't care about ordering, try to insert any in any order, but then it'll return back saying, I've inserted these documents, but these ones didn't insert. So it gives you the flexibility depending on how you want to use that. Uh, so if we're creating a bunch of speakers uh, into our speaker collection, we can just call insert many and pass an array, and we've got our documents inside that array. And now I'll come back saying, I've acknowledged that, and here are the IDs for all them documents. Um, so who's going to go on? So that's how you kind of insert something into Mongo. So obviously, you probably want to read something as well. Uh, so that's pretty much the same. You call db.collection name, then find. You give it a query, and we'll describe what the query is built up in a minute. And then we also give it a projection. So you might not only want to like, get the whole document out of the database. You might want to only just get the, like, the first name of somebody's uh, first name, last name of the person object coming out of the database. Um, so you can query things based on ID. So you can just explicitly say, I want this ID, and just give it the ID straight for that doc one document. We can also query on uh, a property. So we can say, I want to search for something of .NET with the name of .NET Chef. We can also search for uh, objects inside of objects as well. So with nothing fancy, we can just do a dot and do address.city is Sheffield. So that expe expects an object of an address with a field of uh, city on it uh, with the value of Sheffield on it. Uh, we can also use uh, operators on top of this as well. So these are query operators. So we can uh, get things like uh, greater va than values, equal to, and stuff like that. So you can say if the attendees is greater than 50. Uh, there's loads of different uh, query operators. So that, that's a bunch of them on the screen. Uh, so we've got uh, equals, greater than equals, in, less than, less than equals, not equal, uh, not in. Uh, so there's lots of different ways to match things. Uh, so uh, in theory, we could actually do something like this and do uh, greater than 50 and less than or equal to 100. But then we can also use a, um, a Boolean operator of and as well on top of that. So you can say when these two expressions match. And there's also lots of different query op uh, uh, logical operators as well. So um, we can use and, not, nor, and or as well. Um, we can do text-based searches as well. So you can give it a bunch of uh, text to search. So in this instance, we want to search the whole document using text-based search uh, for coffee. And that will just return anything and rank it depending on like, kind of how, how, it relevant, uh, how that is relevant to the expression coffee. 
Um, you can set this up to either do the full document itself, or you can just do individual fields inside the document as well. So if you've got a, for a blog article, you might want to just do the text block of it, uh, not the actual whole thing to actually speed up performance. You can also do um, geospatial queries as well. So there's lots of different types of uh, geospatial queries can run inside it. Uh, but this one just does a geo within a polygon. So this is, draws a polygon on some kind of um, surface area and kind of tries to find anything inside that uh, polygon. Um, so there's lots and lots of different like, ways you can query it using loads of different operators. So I only like covered like, most of the basic ones, really. Uh, it's probably easy to just Google kind of different things what you can query out of it, but most of the things, well, are pretty much everything what you need is actually there. Uh, one thing to note is like um, the where operator just allows you to just run arbitrary JavaScript uh, in your engine as well. Uh, and I've seen on a lot of websites, what they use in MongoDB, that you can just pretty much just throw a JavaScript, uh, some JavaScript into it, and you can just do a DDoS on their, uh, their database because it's just running JavaScript. So uh, try to avoid using where unless you've got something really complex. And if you have got something really complex, make sure you're parsing the data out properly and not just taking something from the UI and kind of just executing it in your database. Um, yeah. And also, obviously, it's a big, massive vulnerability because if they're just matching on documents, maybe it's a users table, you can just pull out all the users and just display on the screen if you want. Um, so the last part of the actual uh, reading a document is actually the projection. So this is where we can actually speed up performance so we're not transferring much data over the wire. Or we might be able to match a covering index which so we don't have to hit disk and get the document. Uh, so we can just say, for this example, if you put a one on next to the field, you just say, like, um, it's saying, I want to just pull that, this one field. And if you specify a field, it won't return anything else back in that document. Uh, we can also explicitly say, I don't want to return this field, so by putting a zero. And uh, by default, the ID is always returned. Uh, and if you don't want it to be returned, maybe you're like, pushing this into a flat file or something else like that, uh, you don't even need it, you can just set that to zero and it won't return it. Um, also, you can do things inside of, uh, project things inside of arrays. So say you've matched uh, attendees' name, you can use the, um, the location operator to say that this location, this array, go project back out this name, and that will just pull back that one, uh, that name what is actually matching. So this is a bit of an example of kind of how you'd find something. Uh, we can use our kind of greater than and less than um, operators and say that we want it between these two dates. And then we can also say, don't uh, give us back an ID. We only want the name of these events. And that will output something like the below. So it'll only project out the, the name uh, and the value for that name between them two given date ranges. Um, so the next one is to update the document. So you most likely want to update your document in your database as well. Uh, we do that exactly the same. We do db dot collection name update one. Uh, we give it a filter. So this is the same kind of filter what we have in our find. So we, we don't need to cover that because it's exactly the same as what we covered in the last uh, slides. But we also then need to give it an um, update condition. And this is how we want it, our document to be updated on finding that item. Uh, we can give it some options. So we can give it upsets. And this is. Um, if it matches that document and it doesn't exist, then it'll insert one. But if it, it doesn't, uh, if it does exist, it'll just update it. Um, and by default, that's set to a false. So it won't update it. It'll only try to update it. And if it doesn't exist, it won't do anything. <laughs> uh, we also have a write concern. So that's exactly the same as when we did our um, insert. We also have the collation. So these are the language rules that are applied when we're updating this document. And we also have array fil filters. So we're not going to cover array filters because it kind of gets quite complex. But this is where you kind of, if you've got an array of an array of array, you can kind of match different things all the way down the tree structure and just update that one item in like six nested deep uh, like arrays if you really want to do, go to that detail. Um, so we can update things just by setting name to Bob. So you can give it a document and say update to this. And this was quite valid uh, until recent updates, uh, which now it actually returns an error saying uh, the update uh, document must contain atomic operators. So this is saying we don't want you to replace these documents just ad hocly and just splat over the top of them each time. Instead, we have these kind of um, update operators. 
So one of them is set. So we can say within this document, once we matched it, we want to set the name to be Bob. And that'll go find one document. Uh, once it's found it, it'll just set that one field to Bob. We also can unset fields. So if we've got a name, uh, if it matches uh, on a document and it's got a name field, it'll just remove that name field out of that document. Uh, if you want to rename a field, we can do uh, a rename. And we can say we want to rename uh, name into first name, and we do that like that. The same for incrementing uh, counters and things like that in a, a document. So we've got a bunch of attendees, and every single time somebody attends, we want to update the count. We can just say increment count by one, and that'll do that in an atomic operation as well. We can also push things into arrays by using push. So that pushes a, an, a, a document with the name of John into an array of uh, attendees. Uh, but like the, um, the filter, we have loads of different types of updates. We can use the um, current date. We can increment uh, values. We can only set things on inserting documents. We can do loads of different things with a slice in arrays. And uh, for each element in an array, we might want to apply a certain like, um, expression. But there's loads of different stuff that you can cover on that as well. And that's obviously all online as well. Uh, so here's a bit of an example about uh, updating a document. <coughs> so we want to match on just exactly the ID of the document in the database. So that's pretty simple, the filter at the top. So we're just saying ID matches this ID. But we also want to set the name to .NET Chef. And we also want to increment the count to 1. And we want to set the last modified to the current date. Uh, so if we had a, do a, a document like the one below, which actually is matching that ID, if that has a name of uh, Sheffield.net, it has a count of 101, and it has a last modified of whenever we actually last modified it. And what this does in an atomic uh, way is just kind of apply that one update after matching it to this document. So this will replace the name, uh, update the counter, and actually update the last modified all in one operation. So this deals with like concurrence issues when you kind of, it, instead of just keep splatting over the same document, and the last person in, you can actually update the individual fields are based on like kind of what you, what your application is doing. Um, so to delete a document, uh, this is pretty much similar uh, to the find uh, um, method. So you just call delete one on a collection with a filter, which is the same filter as what we use for find. Uh, we pass in a right concern to how we want to acknowledge this delete, and then we also uh, pass in the collation. So also the language rules again. Uh, so a little example of this one is we just want to delete this one document with this ID, and it just deletes it for us. Uh, so with the basic CRUD kind of um, way of kind of interacting with the data, that's pretty much it. Uh, but a lot of people use, start using the aggregation pipeline when you want to kind of keep projecting your data into a different form, uh, depending on your usage. And also people use it for like nightly projections of data. So maybe you. You've got some reports where you want to generate every single night. You might run an aggregation pipeline to create a new collection based on your, uh, your kind of current state of your um, collection. Uh, so for this example, uh, we've got a match, which is pretty much the same as our find. We have an unwind. So this is what you apply to arrays. So within a, 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 like an attendee array of a list of attendees, we can unwind like uh, five items in that array, and it'll give us five documents instead with the same fields applied um, each time. <coughs> then we can use group by. So group is like group by in uh, SQL, really. So if we've got a given condition, we can group by that actual condition. Say we want to find everybody with the same last name and count them. We can do that with group. And projects the same as the kind of uh, projection on the find as well. So a bit of an example of that one is we can uh, get a bunch of students and match them on a class of A. So we want all the students with a, uh, which are in class A. We want to unwind all their grades because we've got a, an array of grades. We also want to group by their class ID. So for everybody in class A we've got, we want to group by them and find the average of their, all their grades across every single student in that class. And then we want to project that, emit the ID uh, because we set that to zero. And then we want to set class to be the ID, which is actually the, the class what we projected in the group. And then we want to say project the average as well. Uh, so if we look how that looks when we execute it, 
Uh, we can go do a find on the students, and we've got uh, two, three students in there, two of them in class A with different grades. If we had just applied that pipeline, uh, aggregation pipeline to the students, uh, we just get uh, one document at the bottom which just says, here's the average for class A. And that's kind of how you build up aggregation pipelines. And there's lots of different like, things you can do with aggregation. Uh, you can also run like, multiple aggregation pipelines at the same time and then combine them back up as well. Um, so that's kind of mostly how you interact with your data, uh, with like, kind of saving and querying it. Uh, one of the other things is what Mongo introduced in version 4 is transactions. Uh, so these are pretty simple. You pretty much do session.start transaction, session.commit transaction, and session.bought transaction. So this is pretty much similar to what most people here probably be aware of, of how to interact with a transaction. You don't really care about how it's doing it. You start one. If you need to bought it, you just bought it, and it'll just clean up after you. Uh, but one of the things like uh, with MongoDB, um, transactions should be a least common operation. So by default, you should be using atomic operations. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is because transactions uh, would have to span across multiple collections. So unless you're, um, you've got a really good reason to be able to, uh, for modeling documents across multiple collections, having to query it and update them at the same time, you're probably mo modeling your documents wrong. You probably want to embed them inside another document. Um, so as I said, we should value atomic operations. So obviously, we try to model it uh, with that in mind. So one collection uh, with one document. Uh, also, don't leave transactions open because they consume lots of memory as well. Uh, and shard transactions uh, not out yet, but they're supposed to be released in 4.2 of Mongo. And I'm not too sure what the release date is for that. Uh, so uh, transactions only work on replica sets. So if you're sharding across multiple nodes and splitting your data up, uh, transactions won't work for you either. Um, so there's a few other things what I want to cover before getting into the demo. And um, this is like things what make like MongoD production ready. Um, so one of these is uh, primary and secondary indexes. So most databases out there have these. Uh, or there's a way to actually model your data in a such a way that you don't need them anyway. Uh, but this is pretty much the same as like uh, SQL Server users. So we've got like single compound, multi-key, text-based indexes, geospatial indexes. Um, we also have hashing um, indexes as well. So this is where you give it a, uh, a field in your document, and it'll hash it, and then create an index for that instead, instead of actually using the field itself. And these are actually used by Chardin, but I'll cover that a bit later. Uh, we also can use them for covering indexes and also using index intersections. So that's where you run two indexes at the same time uh, for, two, uh, for the same query and then join them back up and then go receive the data for more performant queries. Uh, replication is by default in Mongo. So uh, the, kind of, um, the default kind of setup, what you should be adhering to, is at least three uh, nodes with two data bearing nodes. So that means you actually have to have your data stored on two nodes, so it's duplicated in two places, with actually three nodes, and that's for how the consensus algorithm works inside it. And this is to make it hi highly redundant. So if one node dies, it just flips over to the other node, what's got the data on it, and can just continue processing while you get the old one back up. And also, it's, uh, if you're trying to update the system as well, you don't want really downtime. So you can take one node out, upgrade it, put the node back in, take the next node out, upgrade it, and put it back in. You can also use it for high availability. So you can make it so you can query to all the slaves in a, uh, uh, a replica as well. And the replication is based on a, a master slave replication. So this means you have a primary node that you read and write to all the time, and then that replicates down to secondaries. You can also chain secondaries as well. So if you want to, to replicate to a secondary, what replicates to another secondary can do that, uh, which is good for if you're going across um, multiple regions within like um, data centers. Uh, you can also read from other secondaries as well if you want faster read performance. But obviously, you might get consistency issues with your data being stale. Uh, as I said, uh, Mongo can scale horizontally as well. Uh, but with this, you need to give it a key. So you, uh, uh, and that's so the database knows how to sc uh, scale your uh, documents uh, horizontally. And this can be given in multiple different ways. So as I said before, we can scale it by hashing a, a key. 
So you can give it any key in the uh, field inside the document to say this is my SHA key and get it to be hashed. And that'll give an easy, even distribution to all your, uh, for all your data across all your nodes. But that actually has a, it has a good high cardinality for kind of the data distribu distribu distribution. But at the same time, it's harder to query things in a range. So if we say we wanted to find all the students where um, they are in certain years, we wouldn't be able to do that. We'd have to do a whole cluster scan, uh, even if we did an index, which is a hashed index on the, the year that they started. Um, and to get around that, we can use a, a range sharding. So this is where we just shard on the actual value, but this obviously then makes the data swift onto different nodes, and you might get hot nodes. So there's about a lot of uh, kind of upfront planning if you want to kind of shard your data, uh, because you need to try to have the most efficient queries, so you know where the data is on your node when querying, but also you want the high distributed like documents, so then you're not getting hot clusters. Uh, and one thing to note, you can't unshard um, your kind of data once it's sharded. To un uh, if you want to move it somewhere else, you've got to then just export it all and then import it into another database and then reshard it. Uh, and I've been in that environment before, and it's not great to be fair, especially if you've got massive large data sets as well. Uh, but the sharding is obviously just for kind of high throughput applications um, where you want to scale across uh, large data sets across multiple nodes, really. And this is kind of what it looks like in like, a, uh, like an overview of it all. Uh, so you would have your application uh, servers at the top, which will talk into uh, like a router. And this is like a Mongo S instance, which then talks to the rest of the cluster. So that knows where the data is um, residing and kind of can coordinate the different queries and where they're going to be placed. So that means when you send a query to your database, it doesn't just go hit a whole hundred uh, nodes. It tries to minimize the impact of actually what, where it's querying. We also have some config servers sat at the side, which are sat in a replica set as well. And this is the kind of the different chunks and where they're placed within the, the cluster, and also the configura whole configuration of how the actual cluster is set up. Uh, so I'm just going to show a bit of a demo of how easy kind of Mongo is to kind of um, add things and query things, really. So to start off with, we just run the database engine. So to run the database, you pretty much just execute MongoD, which is the Mongo process. And then in our other um, shell terminal, we can run the shell. So this is the sh actual shell. Uh, can everybody see that? Do you want to do it? So we can, if we want to show the databases what we've got, we can just do show DBs, and that'll give us a list of databases. We can use the test database by just using, say, use test, which probably most people are familiar with, like with SQL. Uh, so that's switched to my test database. Inside that test database, I can say, show me the collections within that by just typing show, show collections. And it says I've got a, um, an events collection inside there. So I can just drop my database as well, because I want to clear it up anyway. Uh, so I can just do db dot drop database, and I'll be like, yeah, whatever. Uh, so if I show my collections again, he'll say I've got nothing. So this is great. Uh, so if I want to send uh, save a, an, an event into our events database uh, collection, sorry, we can uh, sorry, we can just call insert one onto it, and then we can say, give it a name, and then we can call this dot chef. And we can execute that, and it'll be like, yeah, sure, pull that document in for you. So we haven't actually up front actually declared any schema or a collection for this. It's just said, well, I know you're talking to the events collection inside the test database, and you want to put this document in, so I'll just going to create this test database, this events collection, and then put your document with this schema inside the database. And so we can query the back out by pretty much just calling uh, db.events.find. If you don't specify a criteria for it, it just goes and finds everything in that collection. Uh, so we'll see our document there. And then we can also update it, as we said before, with a uh, update one. Uh, for the moment, we're just, because we've only got one document in there, I'm just going to omit the actual filter and say, any document you find in this collection, go update it. Uh, and then we can go set a field uh, by using the set operator.
So that is going to set a field of day to Tuesday uh, with the first document it finds, which is going to be the only document in there. Uh, and that said, it's found it, I've acknowledged it, I've matched one and uh, I've modified one. So then if you go query it again, um, make it look a bit prettier. This is one of the great things about the terminal, you can type pretty on the end of it. So if you do pretty, it'll actually give you a pretty way. Um, so we've got a new document, uh, well, uh, updated document. It's not changed anything else on it. It's just run that one operation, which is to set the date to Tuesday. And then to delete it, uh, we can just call our delete one. And we, this time we'll pass in the, the ID. So we're going to match on that ID which is the only one document in there, but it's just an example. Uh, it said it's deleted one. Now if you go find it, there's nothing in that collection. So that was just trying to give you an example of kind of the stuff that we covered before and how easy it is to kind of get going. And if you do this in C Sharp, Java, uh, and whatever else language you want to do, it's pretty much exactly the same. There's no upfront declaring any of the kind of collections or types or anything else like that. And it's actually really good for testing. So if you've got an instance of a service, you can spin it up connect it to a database, shove some test data in, and just run it end to end. And it's really easy without kind of, uh, kind of running all your kind of uh, schema creation scripts. So there's a few uh, last things I want to cover before um, I finish up. So these are the misconceptions of MongoDB, what people have. And a lot of people have probably heard about a lot of these as well, and seen them kind of in a lot of uh, blog posts or in the news. So MongoDB loses data. Uh, put your hand up if you heard this one before. Yeah. Uh, so usually this is because people have uh, in configured their uh, cluster incorrectly. So we talked about write concerns of how that acknowledges where it's ri written the data. Uh, just make sure you're using write concerns for your business needs. Uh, the defaults might not be the most preferred ones what you should use. Uh, the defaults actually was updated in uh, the version 1.2. Oh, in version greater than 1.2 anyway. So the defaults before 1.2 was that, that it only acknowledge uh, a request and wouldn't do anything with it, which a lot of the kind of um, misconception around MongoDB uh, came from. Uh, there's a blog article about it at the bottom there as well. Um, also, MongoDB gets hacked. So has anybody heard about this one? Yeah, lots of people heard about this one. So. Uh, over 2,000 MongoDB databases got compromised um, in 2017, I think it was now. Um, and this is because everybody kind of just like deployed their Mongo database in the cloud uh, with the ports open and uh, with no authentication on it. Um, so they probably deserved it, really. Um, so if you're deploying your database, which is not in a private network, just make sure you enable authentication. Uh, also, make sure you enable an SSL as well. So make sure you have a, a, a secure transport to go over and not just dip, shoving raw BSON across the wire. Because if you can read raw BSON, so can the hackers. Um, a lot of the cloud providers like MLabs uh, and Atlas and stuff like that, the cloud providers actually support all this now by default to kind of encourage you to use encryption uh, and, and uh, enable authentication by default. But a lot of people still host their own because they think it's cheaper. So if you're doing that, just make sure you do uh, enable SL, enable authentication. Uh, one of the other things is to make sure you um, keep up to date. So MongoDB rolls out loads and loads of updates. Uh, just make sure you're keeping your cluster up to date, because obviously there's security patches like everything else out there. Um, and yeah, you don't want to get hit by a bug what's already been fixed. So that's pretty much it. So we covered a bit of uh, brief history. Uh, what the document is, how we model it, the different use ca uses of how we kind of interact with that model, uh, document model, uh, how we can shard and use replication, and some misconceptions, really. Um, there's a couple of links what I've put on my slides. Uh, so all the documents are actually online on our website, and I find them really useful, actually. They have a lot of kind of uh, detail in them. Also, there's uh, Mongo University, which is um, great. It's all completely free. Uh, and they've got loads and loads of different courses from there, from like different developer, how to use the database from different developer perspective, from like Python to C Sharp to Java. 
Uh, there's lots of uh, DBA costs on there. There's lots of operations costs on there. Um, so yeah, well worth checking out if you want to find out more. All the code is also open source. So if you go to GitHub slash MongoDB, you'll find the database engine, the C Sharp driver, the Java driver, but pretty much everything is on there. You can comment on it, uh, submit and pull request if you really want to. Uh, do what you, you like, really. Uh, and the last one is a uh, Mongo Playground. So if you've used like try.net or any other like try in a website, uh, this is pretty much the same thing. You have a screen which actually has the data, what you want to insert into the document at runtime, and then you uh, use an aggregation query or some kind of query on the right-hand side, and you can test and trial things out in the browser. Uh, but that's pretty much it. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yeah? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think the document limit size. Um, so the question was, if, is there a document limit size from the Beeson document where you put into the database? Um, the size of it, I think, is actually 16 meg. Uh, so if you've got a document bigger than 16 meg, you have to kind of rethink about how you're going to model it. Or you also have to think, uh, if you're modeling a document, you don't want to expand it too much. So if you're trying to push your logs into an array of logs inside of one document, it might overspan that size. Uh, but obviously, that'll throw you an, uh, an error back. Any other questions? Yeah. How would you get paid by Mongo? Nothing, but I've got some MLAB yeah. stickers. Uh, <laughs> so, in your example, yep. Yeah, so, so usually uh, I go down the, so the question was like, uh, how would you update, uh, keep updating the same uh, different document when you're updating one? So say we've insert an article into one collection and we've got an author, we, we up to, need to update the count of the articles associated to that uh, user. Uh, I'd uh, tr uh, use like more event-driven architectures. So I'd have a, a command that says, go insert me an article into this collection and then once it's inserted, I'll fire an event saying like article created or something like that. And then something else somewhere else would listen to that event and update what it needs to do to make everything uh, consistent with the kind of um, thing what we've just inserted. Cool. Right. Thanks a lot.